just, um, there's an interesting thing that many of you may have noticed, which is that curiosity, when you look at sort of the mythic and folkloric stories that involve curiosity, is often depicted in a really negative light. And so we turned to our resident folklore enthusiast, Andrei Selikov, and he's going to talk a little bit about the concept of punishment and reward in myth and folk tales with Curiosity Killed the Wives. Please welcome Andrei. Hello. <clears throat> she was so pressed by her curiosity that without considering that it was very uncivil to leave her guests, she went down a little back staircase and with such excessive haste that twice or thrice she almost broke her neck. Coming to the locked room, she stopped there for some time, thinking upon her husband's orders and considering what unhappiness might attend her if she was disobedient, but the temptation was so strong she could not overcome it. She took the little key and trembling opened the door. At first she saw nothing because the windows were shut. After some moments she began to perceive that the floor was covered with clotted blood which reflected the bodies of several dead women hanging along the walls. These were all Bluebeard's wives whose throats he set, slit one after another. She thought she would die. She, she thought she, was die, she would die of fear, and the key which she pulled out of the lock fell from her hand. <clears throat> uh, this is a pivotal moment from Charles Perrault's Bluebeard, or La Barbe Bleue, uh, which I have retranslated from the French somewhat to, to preserve some of the more gruesome uh, details which are omitted in a lot of uh, children's translations. <laughs> uh, Perrault, uh, a scholar and one of the earliest collectors of folklore, uh, published this tale in 1695 in a collection uh, of fairy tales which he adopted for, adapted for children somewhat. Uh, we're called the Tales from Mother Goose. Um, the cover uh, which you see here. Uh, this book gave us the canonical versions of many popular European folk tales. Uh, Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> um, uh, Sleeping Beauty. Uh, and Cinderella. Um, there, there isn't a Disney version of Bluebeard, uh, so I'll give a brief recap of the plot, uh, a wealthy landowner with a penchant for alternative hair styling and a history of marriages mysteriously cut short, um, marries anew despite his somewhat grotesque looks. Um, soon after he embarks on a lengthy business trip, his wife left to mind the household, gives her the keys to all the rooms in the castle, including one to a forbidden chamber that she must never under any circumstance enter. Uh, she invites her friends and neighbors to a soiree, and in the midst of the party, spurred by her curiosity, opens the forbidden door, witnessing the scene described in the opening passage. Um, she drops the key in the pot of blood, which, because the key is magical, stains it, alerting Bluebeard that she has disobeyed. Before he executes her in a, man in a manner similar to his previous victims, however, her brothers, who she has managed to alert, arrive and save her, killing Bluebeard. Yay! Now, uh, Perrault published Bluebeard on the very cusp of what we now call the Age of Reason, uh, or the Enlightenment. By then, the scientific revolution had already made certain inroads. Uh, revolutions, yes. Uh, Copernicus died well over 100 years before Tales from Mother Goose was published. Uh, however, some medieval beliefs were harder to dislodge. Um, uh, particularly where women's curiosity was concerned. Uh, according, to, according to Christian church doctrine, uh, curiosity was a vice. Both St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas posited that lust for knowledge, or curiositas, and particularly vain lust for knowledge, vana curiositas, were particularly harm harmful distraction from the pursuit of God and religion. Uh, in this, they drew partly on classical writers and philosophers, uh, the ancient Greeks, 
uh, also had a dim view of curiosity, a quality that they distinguished negatively from the pursuit of scientific knowledge. Um, there are a couple of reasons why women's curiosity was considered a negative quality, quality uh, beyond generally a negative quality, um, even well into the age we, we associate with science. Um, indeed, uh, even during St. Augustine's time, a woman being curious was like twice as bad, or like ten times as bad. Um, these reasons are two foundational myths of Western society. One is classical, um, and uh, the other is uh, biblical. Um, and few stories, uh, few stories are as enmeshed in our culture, in Western culture, as those of Pandora and Eve. Um, if it wasn't for Pandora, the first woman uh, created by the gods and her curiosity, she would not have lifted the, lif the lid of the box or the jar in the original, uh, would not have let out all the evils that plague human life. Had it not been for Eve, the first woman created by God, and her, curio 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 <laughs> her lust for knowledge, <laughs> <laughs> humanity, humanity would not have been expelled from the Garden of Eden. Uh, other examples abound. Uh, had Lot's wife not looked back, right, she wouldn't have been turned into a pillar of salt. Uh, had Psyche, Cupid's wife, not <laughs> broken the interdiction to look at his face, uh, she would not have been sent on a quest to the underworld. Actually worked out pretty well for her because she became a goddess. Um, but uh, so the, the story of Cupid and Psyche brings us back to the folk tales. Uh, this type of tale, the swan maiden, very common. Uh, a man or a woman marries a supernatural being uh, with a strict interdiction not to be broken. Uh, don't follow me into the forest once a month, or uh, don't, don't burn my snake skin, or my swan feathers, uh, or no kissing. Um, of course, of course, curiosity leads the hero heroine to break the interdiction. The supernatural spouse leaves, and they have and they have to go through hell, sometimes literally, to get them back. Uh, in these folk tales, curiosity has an ambiguous role. On the one hand, it is punished. On the other hand, if it wasn't for it, uh, the interdiction wouldn't get broken, and there would be no plot. Uh, but back to the 17th century. The fact that Bluebeard's wife was explicitly associated with earlier myths about the evils of curiosity is made quite clear if we take a closer look at this particular illustration. Uh, here's Bluebeard's wife, furtively on her way down to the Forbidden Room, uh, and in the top right corner, you can see Eve uh, double fisting the forbidden fruit. Um, and the snake, of course, is looking on. Uh, so, although the word curiosité uh, occurs only once in the body text of Bluebeard, Perrault made sure that we were aware of it uh, by adding a moral in the end. He was one of those very tedious people who believe that fairy tales need morals. Um, and here it is. <laughs> so here it is. Uh, curiosity, with its many charms, can stir up serious regrets. Thousands of examples turn up every day. Women give in to it, but it's a fleeting pleasure. Once satisfied, it ceases to be, and always proves very costly. So, this moral, as viewed from the 21st century, is highly problematic. <laughs> I mean, uh, the woman is married to a fucking serial killer. <laughs> Yet, Countless critical interpretations through the 1950s accentuate the curiosity and disobedience motifs, forgoing the psychotic killer with a basement full of corpses entirely. <laughs> it wasn't until the advent of uh, feminist interpretations of folklore uh, that people began grudgingly to admit that Bluebeard's wife, far from being blamed for being disobedient, should instead be lauded for figuring out that something was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and saving herself from a gruesome death. Uh, because even if Bluebeard had indeed murdered his wives as punishment for looking into the bloody chamber, uh, that still leaves a question. 
what the hell did he kill the first wife for? <laughs> Certainly wasn't for discovering a room full of corpses. At that time, it was an empty room. In fact, why does Bluebeard kill at all? Had he been actually worried about his crimes being discovered, why leave the key? Why keep the corpse in, corpses in his house at all, uh, virtually on display? Now, he doesn't really care about hiding his crimes. The whole thing smells of a setup, uh, a way for him to see just far he can push his victims in obeying his commands. In a way, Bluebeard is also curious. Will this wife be the one to pass the test? Will he need to think of another task she's doomed to fail in order to find an excuse to kill her? Um, you can almost imagine him riding in his carriage on the way home from his business trip, uh, shivering with anticipation. <laughs> in the end, his plan is foiled. Although the fact that our heroine relies on her brothers to save her does take away some of her agency. And we can actually turn to a very similar tale to remedy this. Bluebeard is classified as tale type 312, the maiden killer uh, under the Arne Thompson system. Adjacent is t uh, tale type 311, also known as maiden rescues herself and her sisters. Um, the most famous version of this is called Fitcher's Bird, it's a brother's grim tale, but it's also known uh, it's also known as uh, How the Devil Married Three Sisters in Italy, for instance. Um, the setup is very similar. There's a forbidden room and a way for the villain, the devil, evil magician, to know that the interdiction is broken uh, by a curious bride. Only in this version, after the villain marries and kills two older sisters, the younger manages to fool him, resurrects her siblings, and smuggles them out of the castle, usually with a bag of gold. Uh, all on her own without any help. Um, Curiously, it's a more popular version than Bluebeard is in world folklore, or perhaps not very curiously. The widowed, the widowed Mrs. Bluebeard also inherits a fortune and marries again, this time happily ever after, hopefully. Uh, while so many of the myths about curiosity, uh, Eve, Pandora, end with misery and grief, I think this one leaves us with a little bit, of more, uh, a little bit more hope. Uh, and as it happens, Perrault also left us a second moral uh, because, like I said, he really liked morals. Uh, here it goes. Take the time to stop and think and to ponder this grim little story. You surely know that this tale took place many years ago. No longer are husbands so terrible, demanding the impossible, acting unhappy and jealous. They toe the line with their wives, and no matter what color their beards, it's not hard to tell who is in charge. <laughs> So, yeah, I didn't know about this, but apparently sexism was solved 300 years ago. <laughs> so, you know, nothing to see here, folks. Um, no, but seriously, I'd like to raise a glass to our anonymous heroine, uh, because she's always anonymous, and to not minding your own business.